All right, we're going to go over um, how to use a BVM on an apneic patient. Um, before we do so, we're going to kind of describe the steps that we need to take um, in order to successfully ventilate an apneic patient. Um, so first I have my equipment here. I've got suction. I've got my uh, full oxygen bottle with the regulator attached. I've got a BVM. I've got some OPAs and I also have some NPAs. Um, so the first thing we always want to do is make sure that we're in proper PPE, um, which for this case, I would like to have on gloves and eye protection, um, and even a mask if I had one for myself, since we are going to be messing with this guy's airway. Um, so the first thing we want to do is we want to check responsiveness. We want to make sure this guy isn't just sleeping. We want to make sure that he is truly unconscious and unresponsive. So the first thing we would do is we come up and we shake and shout, sir, sir, can you hear me? No response, then we go on to a painful stimulus. I like to use the trap pinch. Uh, that seems to be pretty successful, pinching their, their trap really hard. I see some people are still doing the sternum rub. Um, that's kind of falling out of favor, but it's still very effective. Um, so we need to, um, try to elicit some kind of painful stimulus to see if he'll respond to us. If this patient still doesn't respond to us, we need to then check and make sure that he is breathing and has a pulse. So what we do is we check for a carotid pulse, okay, and we check for anywhere between five to 10 seconds. We also wanna check his breathing at this time. There's a few different ways to do that. I like to just watch their chest rise and fall. Um, some people will actually put their face in the patient's face to fill the air on their cheek. I tend not to do that because I don't want whatever's in his mouth to be in my face. So I'll just check a pulse for 10 seconds and at the same time I'm watching his chest to rise and fall. If I'm not seeing his chest rise and fall, either he's A, not breathing, or B, if he is breathing, it's not adequate. So for this scenario, your patient will have a pulse, will have a carotid pulse, but he will not be breathing. Um, so then we need to uh, do a few more things before we can start to ventilate this guy. First thing we need to do is we need to open his airway. Now there's two ways to open an airway. The first way is called a jaw thrust where you bring your um, fingers underneath their, their jaw and you try to raise their jaw to the ceiling to open their airway uh, to pull the tongue off the back of the throat. While you're doing this, your partner will then ventilate the patient. So that actually takes two people. Um, we do that if we are suspecting any cervical spine trauma um, where we don't want to necessarily crank the head back. Um, the gold standard, the, the, the best way to open an airway though, is in fact the head tilt chin lift where we really crank their head back as far as it can go. And this solves two problems. Number one, um, it gives us a better shot into the trachea where we want the air to go. Um, but it also actually will close down the esophagus, which will limit what oxygen gets into his belly. I usually have my students crank their head back as far as they can and then try to swallow to see how much your esophagus actually cl um, closes the further you push his head back. So our gold standard is to um, do the head tilt chin lift. If you are by yourself and you're the only rescuer, even if you are worried about spinal, um, cervical spine stabilization, we're still gonna do the head tilt chin lift um, because we need to get oxygen into this guy's lungs. Uh, and you cannot do the jaw thrust and ventilate at the same time if you're by yourself. So that's how we open an airway. Once you open the patient's airway, you wanna visually inspect it and remove anything that's not attached. For instance, loose teeth need to come out, um, saliva, vomit, blood, dirt, whatever's in their mouth uh, needs to come out. Marbles, toys, whatever's in there has to come out. There's a couple different suction devices we use. Uh, there is one that's a hand pump. Uh, it's very portable. Um, you simply place the suction tube in their mouth and pump back and forth, and it'll uh, suction out whatever is in his mouth. 
Okay. The second method we have is a battery pack vacuum suction where we will um, place the yank hour. This is called a yank hour. It could also be called a tonsil tip or a rigid suction. We're going to place it uh, just to the back of the oral pharynx where we can see, and we're going to suction on the way out. Okay, we're not doing deep suction. We're actually only suctioning about the same length from the ear to the mouth, or just to the back of the oral pharynx. We're going to suction on the way out, and we don't want to suction for longer than 15 seconds. Uh, and there is an on-off switch on the back of this suction device. Now most of the time when we're suctioning somebody, it only takes a couple seconds to clear out the entire mouth. Very rarely do we hit that 15 second mark. Um, but the National Registry and, and most of your books say that after 15 seconds, you need to attempt to ventilate the patient. What we don't want to do is push any food down um, into the trachea um, because we're ventilating them. So try to clean their mouth out as best you can. Try not to go over 15 seconds um, and suction on the way out. Once his mouth is clear, we need to put in an oral adjunct. So this is called an OPA or oropharyngeal airway. We need to measure this. Let me show you how we measure it real quick. We want to measure it from the side of the ear or the earlobe to the corner of the mouth. So for this specific patient, the yellow OPA uh, is what we're going to use. Okay. To insert it, there's a couple different ways. Um, you can insert it upside down until you feel resistance. And then you're going to go ahead and twist and it'll uh, sit down right on the top of his teeth. I've seen other people, instead of doing totally upside down, they just come in at a 90 degree angle until they feel resistance and twist down and it sits on top of their teeth. Okay. Once that's done, we need to get our BVM ready. Your BVM will come uh, in a bag. We simply pull out both sides. Okay, we unfold our reservoir. And we want to hook up oxygen as soon as possible. And if we're going to use the BVM, we're going to hook it up to 15 liters per minute. Okay. Now for this, the reservoir does not need to be filled up um, before we ventilate. Um, on your BVM, this top part is where the nose goes, and this more rounded part is where the chin goes. We want to be sure to get a good seal on our mask. So depending on the size of your hands, there's a few different ways we can do it. I like to use the, I've heard it called the C3 or the C clamp, where I'm pushing down with these, with uh, my thumb and pointer finger, and then underneath his chin with my other three fingers, I'll actually pull the jaw back into the BVM, and then I ventilate the patient. When I ventilate the patient, I'll ventilate them one breath every five to six seconds. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. You'll notice that I'm not squeezing like this because that's not how we breathe. Uh, and the second question is, how much of this BVM do I need to push to get air into this guy's lungs? The answer is, is it's completely patient dependent. We squeeze the BVM as much as it takes to watch his chest rise. Once we see his chest rise, we stop, and then we wait five seconds and we do it again just until we see chest rise. We do not want to overventilate the patient's lungs. Once we do this for five to ten breaths, we do want to check a pulse again. Um, this guy is very sick. Uh, there's a good chance he might lose his pulse. So we do want to be conscious that we need to check his pulse again while we're ventilating him. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is an NPA. 
We talked about OPAs and how to place them. Let's talk about an NPA and what an NPA is. So this is a nasal pharyngeal airway. Um, if for some reason your patient has a gag reflex or you cannot get an OPA uh, into his mouth, as long as there's no major uh, head injuries, and by that I mean um, skull fractures, basal skull fractures, if you see raccoon eyes or um, bruising behind the ears, which is called battle signs, then you don't want to use an NPA. Um, but if they don't have those, we can go ahead and put an NPA instead of our OPA. Uh, and this is measured the same way. We go from the tip of the ear to the nostril, okay? We put a little bit of lube right on the patient's uh, nostril, and then we slide the NPA down uh, into their nose. That's how we... Um, that's how we place an NPA. Okay, so let's put this all together. Let me show you what it should look like uh, during your testing process. We'll get everything set back up. All right, so I'm responding to a patient that we're not sure if he's breathing. I have proper BSI on. Um, I approach the patient, sir, can you hear me? Can you hear me? No response. I do a trap pinch, still no response. I wanna make sure I have additional resources coming. Um, at this time, because he is unresponsive, I'm gonna check for a pulse and breathing. I'm gonna check for five, but no longer than 10 seconds. You will be told that he has a pulse, but he is not breathing. So right away, I wanna open his airway. I'm gonna do the head tilt chin lift. I'm gonna look in his mouth and I notice that he has some blood and secretions in his mouth. So I am going to suction his mouth. No longer than 15 seconds. Once that's complete, I'm going to measure and place an oral pharyngeal airway. Okay, I'm gonna get my BVM out. I'm going to attach my oxygen to 15 meters per minute. And I'm going to ventilate this patient one breath every five to six seconds. Very important that you have a seal. You don't want any leaking around the cheeks. You want all the oxygen to go right into his airway. And sometime through this, I'm gonna check a pulse, make sure he has a pulse again. If you start to hear some gurgling noises, you might need to suction them again. Um, just because we suction the patient once doesn't mean that's all we're gonna have to suction them. You might have to do it more than once, but for your testing purposes, you'll, you'll only have to suction them once. And that's what I have for you on uh, BVM ventilations of an apneic patient.